The European Middle Ages are quite interesting, because their culture is different from ours in many ways, yet also similar. Modern Western culture derives from medieval European culture, and so we inherit many of its ideas, but use them differently. There are many different sources about sex in the Middle Ages. One of the most interesting types of sources is the church count records. In Western Europe, the church oversaw all laws that concerned personal morality. The ecclesiastical court was regularly used instead of the secular court. Throughout the Middle Ages, some different religious laws and proclamations attempt to restrict when, how, and with whom could have sex. For instance, people were forbidden to have sex on Sundays because it was the Lord's Day, and also on Thursdays and Fridays, which were supposed to be days of preparation for communion. There were also three long periods of abstinence, Lent, which could last from 47 to 62 days, before Christmas, which could be at least 35 days long, and around Pentecost, which could be from 40 to 60 days. Also, many feast days for certain saints would be considered sexless days. During the Middle Ages, penitential books that set forth church rules and penitential practices were popular. Among the many different sins, those related to sexual practices were highlighted. In these penitential writings, it was common to find prohibitions for the practice of oral sex, sodomy, masturbation, and coitus with animals. Among the punishments, we can find some such as the following. Whoever commits fornification with an effeminate man, or with another man or with an animal, must fast for ten years. In another place, it says that one who commits fornification with an animal must fast for fifteen years, and sodomites must fast for seven years. The punishment for masturbation was fasting for twenty days, and if the person kept relapsing, he would be flagellated. Although one could have sex with the spouse, the couple could only do it in one position, the missionary position. This position was allowed based on the fact that it provides less pleasure for the couple, and is also a position that leaves the woman passive, with the man having the full initiative. Marriage existed only to produce children, and to limit the sexual temptation promoted by the devil. Even in marriage, excessive sex between husband and wife was condemned, because the sexual drive was a defect subject to divine correction. Ecclesiastical and civil court documents, almost all of which were written by men, often monks or religious authorities, show that at a time, many bishops held that all sexual acts, even within marriage, constituted sin. However, if it remained within the boundaries of marriage for procreation and did not occur under other circumstances, it was tolerated as a venial sin. To moderate lust was the rule of every good Christian. Excessive sex within marriage was a constant theme in church circles. St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Albert the Great claimed that sex in excess caused a shortened life, diminished the physique, weakened mental acuity, and impaired insight. St. Augustine warned, the man who loves his wife too much is also an adulterer. An orgasm was not considered a rational pleasure and the female body, more prone to sin and corruption, needed constant male supervision. The woman was a seductress, and therefore the harshest punishments were set aside for her. Penitential manuals gradually fell into oblivion during the Middle Ages and were seldom produced after the 12th century. Much was taught and preached about how dangerous lust was, and that people, especially women, could fall into temptation. But all this literature was written by men who were not married and were supposed to avoid women, so of course they wrote about how women were a temptation. As for prostitution, it was considered a sinful act. However, in urban areas throughout medieval Europe, it was tolerated as a necessary evil and we have a video of this very subject that you can always watch. The case of the French cleric Arnaud de Venal exemplifies the sophistication of medieval sexuality at the time. One day in the early 14th century, when Arnaud was a student, he had sex with a prostitute. A few years later, he confessed this lapse to the Inquisition, stating that, At the time when lepers were burned, I was living in Toulouse. One day, I did it with a prostitute, and, after I committed this sin, my face began to swell. I was horrified, and thought I had caught leprosy. Then I swore to myself 
that in the future I would never sleep with a woman again. Arnaud swore that he would never sleep with another woman, but he didn't just give up sex. Instead, he admitted that to fulfill that oath, I started abusing boys. Arnaud's story is not unusual. Many medieval men found themselves with unwanted symptoms after visiting a brothel and attributed their situation to sexual behavior. Among the many medical miracles attributed to St. Thomas Becket, for instance, is the healing of Roger de Beaumont, who became leprous immediately after visiting a prostitute in the late 12th century. Much has been said about the medieval tendency to interpret disease as a product of sexual sin. As a matter of fact, the medical inclination to view disease as sexual sin was not based solely on moral judgments. There were strong medical elements as well. Concerns about the sexual transmission of disease by prostitutes were often approached rationally. Sometimes local authorities took preventive measures, for instance. Medieval physicians saw excessive sex as a real medical problem. Popular myth claimed that several nobles died from sexual excess. According to medieval ideas about the body, based on the system of four humors, namely blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, the behavior of those men who had too much sex posed a problem. The system of bodily humors arose from the idea that health is based on the balance of the bodily humors, and disease is the product of imbalance. To maintain good health, one had to keep the bodily fluids in balance. To do this, one had to expel different bodily fluids, including semen. Regular sexual intercourse was therefore part of a healthy life for most men, but moderation was key. Too much sex would exhaust the body. In most severe cases, it could have fatal consequences. On the other hand, medieval medical authorities held that too little sex was a medical problem. Celibacy was potentially harmful to health, especially for young men. Long-term celibacy meant retaining too much sperm, which would affect the heart, which in turn could damage other body parts. The celibate could experience symptoms such as headaches, anxiety, weight loss, and, in the most severe cases, death. Although celibacy was highly valued as a spiritual virtue in medieval society, the celibate was as much at risk medically as the libertine. For example, King Louis VIII of France insisted on remaining faithful to his wife while fighting in the Albigensian Crusade of 1209-1229. Conventional wisdom attributed his death to the resulting celibacy, making him the most famous victim of death by celibacy. For most crusaders, sexual abstinence was, at most, a temporary inconvenience that they endured until they returned home and were reunited with their wives. But for many priests in medieval Europe, celibacy was a lifelong condition that could present them with a difficult choice. Humor-based medical theory argued that all bodily fluids were processed forms of blood, and that their common origin made them interchangeable. Consequently, regular blood draws were considered necessary for celibate men. Routine bleeding was common in medieval monasteries to balance the moods of monks and minimize the risk of involuntary ejaculation. Crying could also serve as an alternative to intercourse by expelling fluids. Exercise and sweaty baths were also useful for those who wished to practice long-term abstinence. Besides the measures that stimulated the excretion of fluids, the celibate had to be careful about what he put in his body. A man who wanted to avoid sex while maintaining his physical well-being needed to fast regularly and follow a diet mainly consisting of cold foods and drinks that prevent, suppress, and thicken semen and quench desire. Salted fish, pickled vegetables, and cold water were considered particularly appropriate foods for monks. While the most famous cases of death from celibacy involved male clerics, women were equally susceptible to this medical problem in their own way. According to medical theory at the time, both sexes produced the semen necessary for conception, and like sperm, female semen had to be expelled from the body during regular sexual intercourse. In a non-sexually active woman, the semen would be kept in her body. When it grew, it caused asphyxiation of the uterus. Symptoms of this final condition include fainting and shortness of breath, which in the most severe cases could be fatal. For women, as for men, the best way to avoid death by celibacy was to marry and have regular sexual relations with their spouse, sanctioned by the church. If this was not possible, there were several helpful remedies, including restricted diets, and vinegar suppositories. 
Some doctors, however, recommended a surprising alternative, masturbation, contrary to church teaching. When it came to sex, medieval people encountered a dilemma, how to maintain vital physical balance without exposing themselves to disease or sin. The decline of humor-based medicine and changes in religious belief eliminated some of the fears that people dealt with in the Middle Ages, but not everything has changed. The discourse about sex is still about conflicting health demands, social pressure, and personal tendencies. As in the Middle Ages, sex remains both a pleasure and a problem in the 21st century.